From my experience, for some of the best romance stories I've seen, we're gonna have to shift the globe over to Japan. Spice and Wolf is not like the stereotypical romance story in the West. It's mature, down to earth, and has a unique charm all its own. The people feel like they're real instead of caricatures that have one or two personality traits. The story has a unique focus on economics that helps pull the story in interesting directions aside from just the romance. But first, a bit of an explanation. I'll be covering the overall story from the books and for examples I'll be using the anime adaption. The story follows Lawrence as he just finished taking business with a shopkeeper in the small town he's in. Just before he leaves, he ends up meeting an ancient pagan god, Holo, the god of harvest. In exchange for her knowledge and due to his kindness, he agrees to help bring her to her original home far in the north. When writing Analyzed, I'm going to go in-depth into the story of Spice and Wolf. Before we get to what specifically makes the romance in this story work, let's talk about the other aspects. The relationship between Lawrence and Holo develops gradually throughout the 20 plus books as each of them learn more and more about the other. Normally any series that goes on for this long wouldn't be good and would be seen as milking its franchise, but somehow this series doesn't do that. The reason is because this story doesn't really do big skips, it covers their entire journey from the far south of the continent to the far north. Every major event, every confrontation, all of it is presented to the reader. There are some time skips, but for the most part, these are done to skip over downtimes in the story, like such as deep into the winter where nothing happens or long travel sections. The other reason this prolonged story works is because the characters all have goals aside from presenting a story of two people falling in love. Lawrence is trying to make it as a merchant in the world, hopefully getting his own shop one day. Holo wants to go back to her home after being away from her people for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. Each character has their own goals, and romance almost becomes a backdrop to the major events that go on. Of course, their romance does develop, but there is more to see than just their relationship. Now, this may sound odd to the uninitiated, but the use of economics in old-time society within most of the main conflicts is brilliant. The writer actually made me feel tension when Lawrence was trying his best to get a deal to save his investments. The intricacies of medieval economics really adds an interesting layer to the story. Most people, especially those that probably would go out of their way to read a book like this, me included, probably don't have an extremely intimate grasp on economics. For this reason, having it be central to the story is great because most people will be in the dark. Why is this good? Well, it puts the reader somewhere in between Lawrence, a skilled merchant, and Holo, an extremely unskilled merchant which can help connect you to them. Whenever Lawrence talks about an economic concept, you and Holo both get to learn something from it. Another positive this creates is because it makes it hard for the reader to predict how the conflict will end because they will not be able to know any possible solutions without knowledge of how markets work or economics in general. Now what makes the romance work? Well, it all comes down ultimately to three major things. The dialogue or banter between the two characters, the themes that overlay the relationship, and the fact that the series takes its time. Let's start with the first one, the dialogue and banter. When it comes to romance, one of the most important things to consider is how you can make an interesting dynamic between the two characters. Will they have differing life experiences? Will their personalities clash with one another? Will their economic or social status affect how their relationship develops? How do their character quirks play out in each conversation? The power in romantic dialogue is when each character can fit into their own category as much as possible from other characters you've seen before. When you achieve that, then the chemistry between the two of them can feel very dynamic. Most of you will know this saying because it goes around a lot when it comes to stories in every medium. The story is too predictable or some other issue involving a piece of writing's predictability. Some, I would wager to say most people I've seen, care a lot about how easy it is to predict the story. Can you tell who dies by the end? Is it obvious what the conflict will be and how it will be solved? Most see failure in a story that doesn't shroud its ending from the viewer ahead of time, and it reflects poorly on its quality. In a romance story, for the most part, you know how it will end when it comes to the romance. The two characters will end up being together, or they won't. But the ending isn't what a romance story should strive to shroud, at least not mainly. The most important part of the story to Shroud is what the conflicts of the relationship will be and how they are solved, not the ending. In Spice and Wolf, it's hard to predict what will cause conflict between the two characters most of the time because Holo as a character is very unpredictable. She is crafty and just like the main character, we the viewer are usually clueless to exactly what she is thinking. Now why go on this predictability tangent? Well one of the biggest positives to Spice and Wolf's dialogue is how unpredictable it is. From early on, you can understand how both Lawrence and Holo act, and yet each conversation between them is fresh. They never have to retread old ground, old jokes, or plot points that were resolved aren't recycled. Almost every piece of dialogue they are in makes me feel like I've seen a new side of them. So recapping, the dialogue and banter works because of how unpredictable it is and how dynamic both of the main characters are. I'll go more into each character later. Now onto the themes that overlay the relationship. What I mean by this is the messaging or ideas that are tackled through the two main characters' relationship with each other. 
For example, one of the major ideas challenged between them is age. Lawrence is 25 years old while Holo is hundreds of years old with the appearance similar to a younger woman. There is already this idea or maybe challenge presented to the reader from the beginning to evaluate how they feel about the situation. As well as that, Lawrence himself has to deal with the fact that compared to Holo, he is very inexperienced with life in general due to how long she has lived. Romance by itself is just a product of a story which in of itself is not unique. But to make the romance within a story more interesting, unique, and possibly more thought-provoking, you need to add something to it. And I don't mean a spruced up sex life or other love interests, but ideas that come up through the romance. In this story, that issue is the age differences and the problems that arise when a mortal falls in love with a deity. Both of these issues that are presented very early on in the story are constantly challenged and progressively overcome as the story goes on. This makes what could be a simple romance story have multiple layers to it, so even after 8 plus books, it doesn't become stale. Now on to the elephant in the room. I touched on this earlier, but I want to expand this idea a bit more. The pace of the story. The book series at this point is well past its 20th book, and the anime adapts up to book 6. Now normally for other series, this would be, at the outset, seem like a series that's just a bunch of padding, but somehow it isn't. There are around 4 books in total I would consider side stories out of the first 20, and that's it. Everything else is directly related to Lawrence and Holo's journey north. The way this story is treated is the opposite of the normal conventions of writing in many ways. Generally, you don't want to show any unnecessary things in a story, only things that are important for the reader. This helps keep the story condensed and connected. But all of the mainline books are important to the story, cover to cover. The series takes extreme amounts of time and precision to grow the characters organically over what really feels like a full lifetime. To get to the point, this story strives to have character growth and plot progression happen as slow as it needs to be. It allows every event that affects Lawrence and Holo's journey or their relationship to play out on the page. And this might be a divide for people reading these books, but I think it works. It allows the reader or viewer of the anime to fully engage in these characters' lives and to invest in them. From how long I've known these characters, they can sometimes feel more real than people on the street I've seen, and that's very off-putting, but in a good way. Now I've talked about what makes the romance work, but what about the rest of the story? Why does the rest of the story outside of the romance work? While everything else works in a series of arcs, they usually happen within one to two books. Some characters or plot lines appear again later down the line, but for the most part, the external conflicts or story arcs exist in isolation within their one to two books. Most of these conflicts can fit into one of three categories, economic conflicts, romantic conflicts, or a mixture of both. I won't bore you into the deep explanations of these types of conflicts, you get the picture. They work because they ultimately, aside from just being interesting, help push forward the main character's relationship and help build up the world around them. All of these things I described about Spice and Wolf really make it a mastercraft in the romance genre. The story and dialogue really put it ahead above the rest, and that's without even mentioning how unique its premise ends up being. It takes its own approach, goes at its own pace, and trusts the reader with its story. I could go on, and maybe I will in a future video, but for now I hope for those who have and haven't seen the anime or book that you have a better understanding of what makes Spice a Wolf so good. If you want to see more, check out the playlist and subscribe to the channel. I hope you enjoyed, and see you next time.